Welcome back. If you want to have a seat, we will try to resume working. So welcome back to the audience and welcome back to those who are watching us on the web. I have the privilege to chair the second part of this meeting. Uh, we will first hear Professor Sharp, who will explain us all the problems that uh, you run in when you are a male. And with, then with Dr. Trosco, who will describe us a very nice concept of uh, one health, one planet. I'm glad to introduce Professor Richard Sharp, who is working at MRC, University Center for Reproductive Health in Indenburg, where he heads a research program on developmental disorders, mainly male, reproductive health. He is professor in Indenburg University College of Medicine and Veterinary Medicine. His expertise and research interests cover sexual differentiation, development and puberty, and of course related disorder, fetal, prog fetal programming, endocrinology, and the effect of lifestyle. Professor Sharp, the floor is yours, if you like. Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, my thanks also to AFSA for this opportunity. Uh, an opportunity, I hope, to convince you that uh, reproduction and reproductive hormones in particular are an essential factor that you need to take into account when considering the impacts of diets in relation to modern diseases. But I want to start with posing two questions to you. And uh, the first is a puzzle that I will answer later in my talk, but just to ask you, can you identify this risk factor, which is relevant to numbers of you in the room? Um, whilst you're thinking about that, as I say, I will give you the answer later on if you can't work it out for yourself. But I'll move on to a much bigger question, and that is, why are we here? And there are lots of different answers to that. Uh, this is one. Um, but it's probably uh, obviously just a cartoon answer. <laughs> there are many religious groups who feel that they have the answer. Um, whether you agree with that or not, I don't know, but we already know the answer, um, and the answer is that we are here to reproduce. That's what we're designed for. That's the purpose that nature has spent millions of years evolving us with that one purpose in mind. And I think that people just don't seem to recognize and take account of that in sufficient amount. But it shapes our lives, as I hope to show you, and shapes us in ways that affect every aspect from our behavior to our physiology to our diseases. So from an evolutionary perspective, I am actually wasting my time standing up on this podium speaking to you. <laughs> what I should be doing is out there. <laughs> and that makes the point that really, and I'm going to use a bit of humor now to illustrate in fact how reproduction really does dominate our lives and I'm going to illustrate it with male preoccupation with sex, which begins at an early age. <laughs> and once puberty gets its grip on us, then uh, reason flies out the window when sex enters our mind. So, for example, and this extends across the animal kingdom, because here is a male moose under the grip of seasonal testosterone. He wants, there's no lady moose in sight, but hey, there's a stone bison on a plinth. <laughs> so the end result may be disappointing, but the drive is to some extent satisfied. And I always like to emphasize, and I'm sure that all of you in the room, both male and female, can have your own personal examples of 
where common sense and judgment goes out the window, where male sex drive is concerned. And this is probably the best example, um, <laughs> because you can get yourself into awful risky situations. <laughs> so, and as Jeremy Clarkson recently commented, and very accurately, you know, it's not surprising that teenage boys can't keep their bedrooms tidy or have any table manners, because they're, they're simply a life support system for their testicles. <laughs> so, getting a little more serious, reproduction is the focus and, and what we're here for. So the, pro, the question is, when do you start it? So it's quite clear that in what you see here, that it's inappropriate for reproduction to start at these ages whereas it is appropriate at these ages. So what you have to do is to ensure that you can actually achieve that. And so we need to think about what the requirements are for reproduction. So for a woman to reproduce, and you all know, ladies, that you bear the major burden as far as reproduction is concerned, clearly you need appropriate bone and physical development to be able to carry a pregnancy. And you need sufficient energy stores and reserves to fuel that pregnancy and to fuel lactation. So that's a big, big requirement. Um, what the males have to do is, well, very little really. We have to make sperm, be able to have sex, and maybe have a few fights with other interested males. But we are if you like, built with different purposes in mind. But certainly as far as female reproduction and female puberty is concerned, food, fat stores, and a functional reproductive system are what are essential. And if we go back 10 years, then our understanding of the reproductive system is essentially sketched out on this slide, because what we understood is that neurons in the hypothalamic region of the brain secreted gonadotrophin-releasing hormone into the portal blood system, which traveled to the pituitary gland, where it regulates the synthesis and the secretion of the pituitary gonadotrophins, luteinizing hormone, follicle-stimulating hormone, which are the hormones that regulate the development and function of the gonads, the testis, and the ovary. And in their turn, the gonads produce sex steroids, primarily estradiol in the non-pregnant woman and androgens in the male, that feed back to the brain in a negative feedback sense, but also have a multitude of other effects, as we'll describe certainly for androgens. And so this system is kicked in at puberty, and really doesn't function to the same extent before, a little bit during the postnatal period and a little bit in late gestation. But the hormones are very important as we'll come to understand. Now, the, perhaps the major development in reproductive endocrinology in the past decade has been the discovery that there's a whole series of systems that lie above this and that regulate that reproductive system via regulating GnRH, and these are negative and positive inputs from the KISS-1 system, KISS peptide, and neurokinin B. And the importance about this discovery is not that there's another center of control that's higher than this, it's that these interface with energy stores and the metabolic system. So they provide the interface by which, if you like, puberty can be judged when it's appropriate to start, although we still don't really understand if that is the key. So, for example, then we know that fat tissue produces leptin, which can have feedback effects to the brain and to the gonads. We know that the pancreas obviously produces insulin, which obviously plays a role in regulating fat stores, but also has effects on the brain and the gonads. And we're discovering every, well not every day, but every year, more hormones produced by the gut, the stomach, and the gastrointestinal tract that play a multitude of roles which are still evolving, but which can certainly play a role in regulating appetite, as well as having effects on the gonads 
and regulating sex steroid production. And even bone steps into this. We know that at least one factor, osteocalcin, can play a role in regulating both ends of the system, so providing a way via which the skeleton can actually talk to the body. So that at least you can begin to imagine, even though we obviously have an incomplete picture, that there are multiple systems here that all feed into the reproductive system that would allow some sort of decision to be made that now is the right time to kickstart reproduction or no, it's not the right time. So the reproductive hormones themselves, the sex steroids, have a multitude of effects. They literally shape us. They decide whether we look like male or female. They affect body growth rates, final height, skeletal effects, body composition, muscle and fat amounts, and where it is, brain development and organization, all of the major organs, the immune system, and of course, puberty, sex drive, function, and fertility itself. So I don't think you can, this is not a complete list. You can't get something that's more pervasive than that. So reproductive hormones play an integral role in virtually every aspect of our lives and throughout our lives. And I put this up earlier, and the risk factor here is actually just being a male. So just being born a male actually makes you a member of this club with all those increased risk factors. So we're here to reproduce, but we have completely different roles, as I've briefly outlined, and we have to be made fit for purpose, obviously. Uh, and the way the body develops in utero is that we would all become female, um, and male is a modification of that. So what is it that brings about that modification? So here we have a quintessential XY macho over-the-top male. Nobody would not look at this and think, yes, testosterone, that's male sex hormones in action. But what about this XY individual? Very, very different looking. Clearly, no Arnie Schwarzenegger, phenotypic female. And yet, she's XY, and she has testes. They form normally during fetal life. They made hormones normally during fetal life. But she has an inactivating mutation in the androgen receptor, which means that she can't respond to male sex hormones, to androgens, testosterone, and dihydrotestosterone, which means she can't masculinize. The net result is that she develops down the setup pathway, which is to become female. So she appears female. Her internal reproductive system is wrong because that is male. But although she has a, a blind end in vagina, but her body fat distribution is female. Her brain is female. In all respects that have been studied so far, she appears to be female. So this illustrates in the most dramatic way possible how critically important fetal androgens are. They literally are the difference between men and women. And you can't get anything more fundamental than that. But there are other consequences of this. For example, we store fat differently. So us men choose to store our fat here within the abdomen, highly unattractive to both sexes, I think. <laughs> Whereas you ladies choose to store your fat subcutaneously and in much more attractive places, to us men anyway. Um, and then the question is, well, why? Well, again, it's being fit for purpose. So the thinking, I'm not sure that if we could say that it's been proven, is that what a woman needs is a long-term energy store that she can mobilize during pregnancy and lactation. So she doesn't need rapid access, if you like. From an evolutionary perspective, what he needs is when he's chasing food, or more likely chasing women, or chase, get, trying to get away from predators, he needs rapid access energy. 
And so you store your fat within the abdomen where you have a rich vascular supply where you can rapidly access it and activate it, utilize it. Of course, this happened or evolved in a time when nutrition was in short and calories were in short supply. So in a modern context, the price that we pay for this is substantial because that's one of the major causes of why men are at increased risk of cardiovascular disease, which in turn is the main reason why men die earlier than women. And there are a whole range of diseases which are different in men and women, and um, I'm not going to talk about those. But what I am going to focus on is the fact that that visceral adiposity is associated also with reduced testosterone levels. And that is a, a bad sign for a lot of reasons that I'll go into in a minute. So we'll skip that slide and come back to this. So what this example gave you was a real black and white example of, if you like, having androgens and not having androgens if you're a XY male. But what our interests are, and the, one of the big developments in the, over the last 20 years has been the realization that in fact there are probably subtle deficiencies in androgen production and action in male fetuses that are remarkably common. And what these do is result in disorders that you can see at birth, those in blue, or in young adulthood, those in white. And the purpose for showing you these is to bring home to you that these are not rare, they're not uncommon, they're extremely common. So, for example, in Northern Europe, then across all, at least eight different countries there, then one in five or one in six young men, so this is men in their prime, will have or have had one or more of these disorders, which is a fairly shocking statistic. And What's evolved, the thinking that has evolved over that period, is that these may have fet a common fetal origin. So this is what is termed testicular dysgenesis syndrome. So that these disorders, although some may rep uh, manifest at birth, and the others manifest 20 or even 40 years later, that they have a common origin in fetal life, and most likely as a consequence of subtle deficiencies in the production or action of androgens. And as a consequence, what we've come to realize is that this isn't just throughout fetal life, it's during a very discrete programming period, what's been termed the masculinization programming window. Now, this has been deduced from animal studies where you can do the appropriate experimental interventions. What it shows is that there is a critical period before the reproductive system actually differentiates when you need sufficient androgen exposure to set everything up. That's why it's called a programming window. And that's the point at which you have decided the functionality of the reproductive tract and ultimate reproductive organ size, the size to which all of your reproductive organs will grow. Now, our best estimate of when that equivalent window is in the human, and we can't prove that it's there, but all the evidence points that way, is that it's within the period 8 to 14, maybe even 8 to 12 weeks of gestation. So this is when the fetus is 2 to 3 centimeters. So at that point, you've decided the future of male reproduction and whether it will be good or bad. So what that's done, this thinking has actually, if you like, changed the questions that are now being asked. And this is where it becomes relevant, I think, to EFSA and to diet is because now the questions are, what is it that affects this process to cause these perturbations? Because whatever it is has to work through the mother, and therefore it's going to be dietary, lifestyle, chemical exposures, or a combination of these. And you can imagine just how difficult it is to actually decipher what these may be when you may have to wait 20 or more years for an outcome. So they're extremely difficult logistical studies to do. 
But I want to focus very much on the low testosterone because I think that's the, the, the glue that actually keeps this talk together and will focus your attention. So because what I'm talking about in those male reproductive disorders is faulty fetal programming. And I'm sure you're all familiar with the, the Barker hypothesis and everything that's happened in that area since in terms of fetal programming of adult cardiovascular disease, blood pressure, metabolic syndrome, etc. So summarized on this slide is simply the one such study showing that if you look at birth weight and then you measure deaths from coronary heart disease, or it's the same picture if you're measuring blood pressure in adulthood, the higher your birth weight, the lower your blood pressure, the lower your risk of coronary heart disease. And exactly the same is true for testosterone, except that the testosterone goes in the other direction. So the higher your birth weight, the higher your testosterone in adulthood, independent of your adiposity or any other factor that may secondarily influence it. So birth weight is integrally related to your risk of disease and to your testosterone levels. And when you look in adulthood at the associations, the diseases that are associated with significantly reduced testosterone levels in adult men, then you can see that this is simply a readout of modern Western metabolic dysfunctional diseases. Although I've added erectile dysfunction on the bottom there because that's something that will come with chronic testosterone deprivation. And erectile dysfunction is important because it's probably the best way of focusing a man's mind on the reason to, a reason to lose weight and to get rid of that visceral adiposity. But also because one of the other things that's come to the fore in the last few years is that we know that if you get erectile dysfunction, certainly in later life, then before you actually go and see somebody about getting Viagra or whatever, you should go and see a cardiologist because it's early warning of a cardiovascular event. So when we come back to this, we can look at it from another perspective because this was all about how important androgens are for the male. But it's also telling you something that androgens are also something that females want to avoid. So if you are a normal XX fetus, you don't want to be exposed to androgens because you will be developed like Arnold Schwarzenegger. So it's as equally important for a female to avoid androgens in fetal life as it is for a male to be exposed to them. And um, we know that in males, in adult males we're talking about now, that as intra-abdominal fat increases, testosterone decrease, insulin resistance increases, and these conspire to lead to more fat deposition and everything that lies downstream of that. But in women, it operates in exactly the opposite direction. So that you need high androgens to induce those changes. And we know this from one of the commonest, or if not the commonest, reproductive disorder in women of reproductive age, and that's polycystic ovary syndrome, PCOS. Because the PCOS phenotype involves increased androgen production, by the ovaries, leading to hirsutism, but it also is associated with increased insulin resistance and metabolic dysfunction. There's anovulation. There's greatly increased risk of type 2 diabetes, etc., etc. And this is associated, and androgens are a primary driver in that process. But what animal studies in non human primates? and in uh, sheep, and indeed in laboratory animals have shown, is that you could induce a very similar phenotype by exposing females to androgens in utero, so that we can simply swap the sheep there for the woman, and you could administer the androgens either directly to the mother, or you can 
administer them directly to the fetus, you end up with the same result. So that if you actually look at a group of adult sheep, female sheep, this is, and you actually measure insulin resistance, then you can see here that if you administer testosterone, you elevate testosterone levels in a normal adult female sheep, you increase insulin resistance. But you can create that by exposing the female sheep in utero to excess androgens, where you permanently create that phenotype. If you then come along and inject these programmed animals, which are insulin resistant as a result of fetal androgen exposure to extra androgens, you don't have any additional effect. And of course, if you did the same effect in males, you have no effect. Males like androgens. The only way you can induce insulin resistance in males is by decreasing androgens. So, in many respects, I suppose, this fits with the sort of males and females being opposites of each other or mirror images. So, in terms of reproductive function, in our modern world where obesity is so prevalent, this has major effects on reproductive ability. And again, it's, I'm afraid, women who bear the brunt of this because it impacts virtually every part of the reproductive process, from ovulation to fertilization to implantation, embryo and fetal development. Every aspect is impaired to a greater or lesser extent. In males, okay, if you eat a diet high in saturated fat, there's evidence that it can reduce your sperm number. Certainly the obesity or visceral obesity will reduce your testosterone level, which is bad news, which in the long term, they give rise to erectile dysfunction. But the effect is less on the males. But I'm sure you've all got your lists of diseases that are associated with dietary uh, effects, particularly with a modern Western diet. This, this is a list that's got some of them on there, but it's simply to show that those in pink are all reproductive. So reproduction is a, is a, a big outcome of these but remember also that reproductive hormones are also paying their part in a lot of these diseases. So in the last few minutes, what I want to do is um, change tack and just get you out of your thinking, your present thinking, and to think a little more differently. And it comes back to this question of why we are here. Because we're here to reproduce. And as I said before, Nature has taken a long time to fashion us for that purpose. But reproduction is also an opportunity. It's an opportunity to change the offspring, to make them different to you, to make them better adapted to the new environment. And from a Darwinian point of view, then sexual reproduction is the way that you might actually achieve that. Um, but that is a random event and it's just, if you like, in the hope that a particular recombination event will give you a phenotype that is better adapted to the environment. So in terms of probably over thousands of years, that might work okay. That doesn't seem like a very wise plan for something where if you want to adapt rapidly to the now. So when we think about inheritance, Obviously, we get our DNA from our parents. Okay, it's put together or recombined in a different fashion, which makes us unique and different from them. And if you then start asking, for example, in terms of obesity, then what role does that inheritance play in determining obesity? Well, the estimates are that, you know, perhaps even a majority of obesity is explained by inheritable factors. But when you look... In the, for genetic explanations for that, by GWAS, etc., then so far less than 5% of that has been accounted for. And my suspicion is that it's not going to get much better than that. Because when you think about it, we've already heard about epigenetics. This is a much more sensible way of going about things. Because 
This is a rapid adaptation that you can affect within hours or days and that could actually better adapt the fetus or maybe even beyond that by altering components not of the DNA but of DNA methylation or histone methylation more likely. Um, and, and of course this was a slide, sorry, for an audience less educated than you to try and illustrate that DNA is a bit like a wheel clamp on a car. So I want to come back to this that I slide that I've been showing you repeatedly. So reduced testosterone associated with visceral adiposity in uh, adult men. Well, here's a study done by a clinical endocrinologist in my group when he was doing his PhD, Tom Chambers, where he's induced a similar phenotype in adult male rats and, and not in females. So I just want you to focus on the red bars because what this does is show these adult males to show that they have visceral adiposity, they have increased plasma leptin, which you would expect with that, they're insulin resistant, I haven't got that on this slide, and they've got reduced testosterone and elevated LH levels, which is what we would define as primary hypogonadism or compensated Leydig cell failure. So how did he achieve this? Because in, in our male, then what we, oops, sorry, I'm going the wrong way. What that achieve this in our male is overconsumption of calories. But in fact, these rats that I showed you at a normal control diet. What in fact had happened is the grandfathers had been fed with a high fat diet for 14 weeks, not sufficient to actually make them diabetic or even majorly insulin resistant. It caused about a 10% increase in body weight and probably was rather comparable to, what, to eating what a modern Western diet or overeating a modern Western diet would do for you. And yet, this had consequences for the grandsons that made them insulin resistant and also affected their reproductive hormones. So that effect has to be epigenetic. Now, I wish I could tell you how that effect is transmitted. We still don't know. So what it appears is that when you pass things on to your children and your grandchildren, it isn't just your DNA, but it's also epigenetic reprogramming in potential. And I wonder whether these effects really are telling us that this is nature's solution to adapting us or trying to better adapt us to the perceived environment out there whilst in the womb. And in this regard, I think it's very interesting that when you look at the fetus and at fetal germ cells, so it's the germ cells inside the fetus that will give rise or contribute to the grandchildren, then those germ cells are epigenetically remodeled during fetal life. So for example, DNA methylation is wiped clean early on in gestation and is reinstated later in gestation. And histone modifications, at least we know that for some aspects of histone methylation, there are also dramatic changes. There are numerous histone changes that could occur, and I don't think most of them have been investigated in detail during this period. But one way of looking at these changes is they provide an opportunity, a window of opportunity to actually sense the environment via the mother and to introduce changes to the epigenome which may affect how those offspring or the future offspring will function in what is perceived as the environment out there. Food for thought. So overconsumption of calories is what makes us fat but also affects our hormone levels but I think the idea that it may affect your children and even your grandchildren is probably a very scary. How important it is, I don't think we have any clue as yet. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Sharp.
I think that we can have now questions from the floor. Please wave the hands. Okay, one question over there, please. One question in the middle. Oh, one, okay, start, please. Myself? Yeah. Thank you. Um, Alberto Mantovani, National Health Institute of Italy. Quick question. Uh, prostate, it's essential for reproduction, is heavily modulated by androgens and uh, is, uh, well, is a quite frequent target of disease in our Western world. How can it fit, or if it fits in this picture? Yeah, that, that's a, a good question, because it was a, a notable, notable absentee mm -hmm. from my slides. Yet I think prostate and prostate cancer are, is a very different situation, which if I was to actually, this cuts a lot of scientific corners, I would say that it's associated more with overexposure or high exposure to androgens in utero. So, for example, where you look at countries that have a high incidence of these disorders that we think can be due to low fetal androgens, then they tend to have a correspondingly high incidence of prostate cancer. Um, so, but I think that that's interpretation. You know, it's another thing to actually be able to prove that. But I think prostate cancer is, a very, is, a, is very different to these other male reproductive disorders. Yes, just in front. Okay. The mic is not, mic working. Is not working. Does it work now? Yeah, that's good. Yeah. University of Massachusetts, Alexander Suvorov. Uh, during spermatogenesis, uh, histones are mostly substituted by protamines in order to achieve a tight package, uh, packaging of uh, chromatin. How, how do you think this uh, epigenetic information uh, linked with uh, modified histones may be transferred to next generation. Thank you. Well, I, I think first of all I should say that we, we don't know that disorders, that sorry, changes, intergenerational effects of the sort that I showed you are transmitted via sperm, via histone modifications. I was giving that as an, as an example because there is, there are published studies showing that histone modifications might be one vehicle for transmitting effects but not necessarily via sperm. Now, I'm not, all, not all histones are replaced, and actually in human sperm, they're probably less replaced than there are in, in for example, in rodent sperm. But I think, no, the, the question is, as to how these effects might be transmitted is still unclear. It may not be via sperm themselves. It could be via seminal plasma. You know, there are even instances now where they're finding that what have been classed as epigenetic effects are actually being transmitted by behavioral changes in one or other parents. So I think you have to have a completely open mind about this at the moment. Um, it wasn't so many years ago when we had no idea about how these sorts of effects might occur. Well, we didn't think they could occur. So I think we will know in time, but not at the, not at the moment. Yes, one question over there. Thank you. <clears throat> Andras Sekac, I'm uh, from the Agroenvironmental Research Institute from Hungary, also a member of the management board of EFSA. Uh, my question, you have underlined uh, the importance of exposure or the absence of exposure to natural hormones, testosterone. So how do you view the role, the possible role of endocrine disruptors compared to this effect of food or environmental origin? Yeah, well, again, that, that is a, a pivotal question which I think a lot of people are trying to answer. Um, some people think they have the answer that, you know, a lot of these chemicals do cause effects. I think clear evidence that they are causing such effects, that, are, that they are major players in, in terms of perturbing sex steroid hormone action or production, uh, we really don't have that evidence. Um, I'm not saying that we won't find it in time, but I think it's only going to be one player. 
Um, I think there have to be other factors that are likely to impact that. Um, for example, we know that pharmaceuticals can in utero and dietary effects are becoming ever more uh, a possibility on that particular stage. Dr. Sharp, uh, I just want to offer another explanation to the question about prostate cancer. A uh, famous uh, pathologist at University, uh, Johns Hopkins University uh, stated that the only two animals on earth that get prostate cancer is the human and the dog. And while the chimpanzee, the monkey, and the ape are genetically more closely related to humans than the dog is, it turns out the dog shares the human diet, eating grilled meat. In other words, table scraps. Whereas the chimp eats meat, and the ape and so forth will eat meat, they eat it raw. And so the implication in that interpretation is the grilled meat contains PAHs, the carcinogen. And uh, this seems to be backed up with some animal experiments. Any other question? I had a very short one. You uh, highlighted that there is a very narrow critical period for brain differentiation, for sex differentiation. And, and uh, you then alluded to the Barker hypothesis, which related um, birth weight to later diseases. And uh, wh what do you think? Things are now appearing more complex because we have studies showing that term normal birth weight infants may have insulin resistance, for instance, during uh, early adulthood or uh, adolescence, related to a faster growth rate. And, and this is broadening the idea of a critical period, unfortunately for us. Yeah, I, I should make clear that when I'm talking about this masculinization program window, this is a critical period for setting up the reproductive tract, not the brain. And we don't know, for example, for androgen effects on other organs, whether it be on the liver, the pancreas, or whatever, we don't know what the critical windows for that are. It may be completely different. It may be much broader. It may be at a completely different time. But brain masculinization, the critical period is at the end of gestation. So it's at a completely separate time for masculinization of the reproductive tract. Any other question? Yes. Um, okay. I'm from China and Ili Dairy. My question is actually about the inheritable traits from the parents and grandparents to grandson or son or daughter. Um, I, you, you mentioned that the, the trait of the obesity can be Trans, uh, transferred to the grand, uh, grandson of the rat from the grandfather. Um, but on the other hand, you also mentioned that obesity is only 5% uh, transferred to the uh, offspring from the parents. So this is a little bit contradictory. And what, what could be the factors that contribute to this inheritable traits to the offsprings, in your opinion? Thank okay, you. no, no, I, I, was, I was trying to draw the distinction between um, DNA inheritance and other forms of inheritance, such as epigenetic inheritance, if I can use that term. So that although heritability of obesity seems to be reasonably well established from twin studies, or so I'm assured by my colleagues, then um, we can't explain it, at least at the present, by changes in DNA itself by particular genes. So. To my mind, that maybe means that we're, we're looking in the wrong place, and therefore it might be epigenetic. Now, what I was then showing where you're transferring a trait to the grandsons, of course, is, is addressing a slightly different question, because now you're taking it the generation beyond. Um, although inheritance is still a factor going down the, um, the grand paternal line. So I think you can't mix those two up. Um, 
it's suggesting that epigenetic mechanisms may play a role in programming of obesity because I think in all the studies where people have done interventions where they show intergenerational effects and it's all in animal models with a little bit of human evidence, it's all dietary effects and it's always affecting the metabolic system. So that's another thing which says to me that it's designed for a purpose, but that's only guesswork. Uh, Nico van Belsen, International Dairy uh, Federation. Just to follow up in the, on, on that last point, I agree with you. It's probably designed for purpose. I think it makes sense from the point of evolution to have an uh, epigenetic mechanism that can tell the next generations, kind of, these are the circumstances that have been occurring and perhaps adapt them in, 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 in some way to that. I would expect um, then, actually, that after some time there would be kind of reset effect. So perhaps it's not the grandchildren, but the grand-grandchildren. But at some stage, I would expect, actually, that these epigenetic effects would, would kind of die out or, or dilute or whatever. Yeah, the, the only studies that I know of this have, have been looking at um, metabolic dysfunction in, um, with fetal programming by glucocorticoids. And they show that they become almost extinct by the third generation. So, so I think you're correct. Okay, do you, not, do you have any other questions? If not, I thank you very much again, Professor Shaw.